Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name's Tiffany, but you can call me Tiff. Welcome to the second episode of Tasty True Crime Tuesday. Today, I'm fucking starving, first of all. I've got a Chinese and I'm, I'm so excited. Before I start with the um, case, I need to just have If anyone says they don't like Chinese, I think you're lying. You're a liar. That's it. I'm just gonna have a bite of my pancake really quickly, my duck pancake. Is there anything better than a duck pancake? There's not. So Oh my god. Just delicious. So before we get started, I am just going to give my disclaimer that this video will contain information that some people may find upsetting, so viewer discretion is advised. The case we're going to be covering today is the horrific, and when I say horrific, I mean horrific, murder of Sylvia Fleming. And I'm not even going to lie guys, this case, it's actually kept me up at night, I just, I just cannot fathom how someone could do this to someone else. But anyway, enough of me rambling on, let's just jump straight into it. Sylvia Fleming was born on the 11th of October, 1980. And I believe she sp spent her whole life in the town of Omagh, which is situated in County Tyrone Island. Omagh was said to be a busy town, but it had a very small population of just around 20,000. As you can imagine, with small towns, it's more like a community, more like a family. Everyone knows each other, everyone recognises each other and there's a lot of gossip and but everyone just kind of looks out for each other. So that's what Sylvia grew up knowing. She grew up knowing this lovely small town of Omar and she had two older sisters. So she was the youngest out of the three sisters. Her oldest sister was called Josie and the middle sister was called Kathleen. All three, so Josie, Kathleen and Sylvia were raised by their father at first, but unfortunately he couldn't continue to look after them. He started to struggle a bit, so he decided to put them in care willingly because he thought that they would have a better life in care because he just couldn't provide for them. Now sadly Josie did say that all three sisters suffered from physical abuse while in care. Even though the sisters, they were never broken up, they would always stay together. Regardless, physical abuse or emotional abuse is still abuse at the end of the day. Um, but this abuse kind of brought them closer together because they felt like they were all they had. And Josie has said that they meant the world to each other. They just loved each other so much. And when they would suffer from the abuse or if something did happen, they would come together and they would support each other. And Josie really tried to become a mother figure and look after the girl. And she really tried to protect Kathleen and Sylvia. Now it's said, as a result of this abuse, this really affected how Sylvia formed relationships. She didn't really understand what a healthy relationship was and she was so vulnerable. I think all she really wanted was just like a family unit because she'd never had that. Um, but she so desperately wanted to be part of a happy family. But regardless of the difficulties that Sylvia faced when she was growing up or when she was in care, she still tried so hard in school. She really wanted to get good grades because she wanted to make a better life for herself. Sylvia was said to be really, really popular in school because she was just such a kind-hearted and lovely person. And it was also said that she was really, really good at art. She was a really artistic girl. In 1997, at the age of 16, Sylvia finished uh, secondary school and she went on to do another course in hairdressing. And while she was studying, she also went on to get her first job, which was in a nursing home. And she seemed to really enjoy this job. She was really excited that she was gonna have some money coming in. She felt like an adult. She had her first job. You're like, you know how it is. You've got your own money. No one can tell you what to do now. And then shortly after this, Sylvia's older sister, so Josie, actually announced that she was pregnant and it said that Sylvia was so excited by this. She could not wait to be an auntie and Josie ended up getting her own flat. So she invited Kathleen and Sylvia to move in with her and they really felt like, you know, this was it. Their life was turning around. Things were coming together. Everything was going to be okay. But 
When Sylvia was 17, she ended up going to a flat party. And this flat belonged to a 26 year old man called Stephen Scott. Stephen Scott, let me tell you about Stephen Scott. First of all, I hate him. Stephen Scott was a part-time bodybuilder, part-time firefighter. And I didn't even realise that you could be a part-time firefighter, but just shows how much I bloody know. And it was said that Scott was quite, he was quite Jack the Lad. He loved himself, he fought a lot of himself, and he, he was very cocky. He just seemed to be up his own ass, to be honest. Scott's nickname was actually Bulldog. Um, I think it's because he's fucking ugly, but apparently it's because of his stocky build, because he was like quite short and stocky and he had like broad shoulders. Stephen had just recently moved to Omar, so no one really knew him very well. No one really knew his past. They didn't really know his family. He just moved to Omar and he started making friends, but not friends with people his old, own age. Oh no. He started making friends with 12 year olds, 15 year olds, 18 year olds but no one within his age group. It was said that Stephen portrayed himself as a really popular guy, like he wanted everyone to think that he was popular, he wanted everyone to think that he was the main guy, um, he was really macho, a proper man's man, like would never shed a tear, that kind of guy. So Stephen and Sylvia met and they hit it right off at the party, so shortly after that they started seeing each other and sleeping together, and eventually this led to them becoming boyfriend and girlfriend. Now, bearing in mind, Sylvia is 17, this man's 26. So there's nearly a 10 year age gap. Josie said from the minute she met Stephen, she didn't like him. She thought he was cocky. She thought he fought a lot of himself. She just thought he was a prick, basically. She said that he craved attention, like he would demand it. He wanted to be center of attention all the time. But obviously love is blind. So Sylvia didn't see any of this. She didn't see how bizarre it was that a 26 year old was interested in a 70 year old and i'm not saying that in a rude way but especially a 26 year old guy you would think maybe he'd go for maybe a 24 year old 23 year old but not a 17 year old she must have felt like she'd hit the jackpot she'd got this guy that she thinks the coolest thing in the world she thinks he's so handsome she thinks he's sexy she thinks he's so popular so she's thinking that she's you know, cool too. And she's also thinking that he's a, a firefighter and a bodybuilder and he can bring her that stability that she's always craved and that family unit that she's always wanted. Because Stephen was so much older than Sylvia, 26, I think he probably knew that he could manipulate and control Sylvia, especially with her background, her childhood. I think he knew how vulnerable she was and he definitely played on that. And you know, it's just, it's so heartbreaking because it's Sylvia, Sylvia was in love with Stephen, she was head over heels for him and she thought that Stephen loved her back. So like I said, Stephen, he wouldn't make any mates his own age. It would always be much younger people. So his flat allegedly was always filled or there would always be teenagers in his flat drinking and smoking because they probably thought that, oh, Stephen's so cool, he's letting us drink. I mean, no. First of all, he's a bad fucking influence. And second of all, he's a weirdo. Like, I'm not being funny. I'm 27, right? I cannot imagine hanging around with 12 year olds, 13 year olds, 15 year olds, because it's just weird, bro. Like, go and get mates your own age. I mean, that definitely should have been like 100% something is not right there. It's also said that Stephen had a really, really unhealthy obsession with serial killers. Um, he idolized them, basically. He thought they were the best thing ever. Like, he thought Charles Manson, he thought Ted Bundy, they were fucking fantastic. Oh yeah, you kill those women and you abuse them. You're my type of guy. I think he had around 10 books on Ted Bundy. Who the fuck? has 10 books on Ted Bundy. If you go to a lad's house and he's got 10 books on Ted Bundy, get the fuck out of there, hon, because I'm telling you, he's gonna, he's a nutter, okay? He's gonna kill you. In February 1998, Sylvia decided to move in with Stephen, and this is where he tried to really isolate Sylvia. He didn't want her to have anything to do with her sisters or her friends. He was really trying to isolate her, so he was the only person she could have. And that is one of the biggest traits you see in abusers. They don't want you to have friends. They don't want you to have a relationship with your family because 
then it wouldn't be easy for them to control you, manipulate you, abuse you because your family or your friends would be noticing it. And after a while, Sylvia's friend did recognise that Stephen was becoming very abusive to Sylvia. And it got to the point where Stephen didn't even care. He would demoralise, belittle, embarrass Sylvia in front of people. He would talk down to her. He didn't care. He didn't care. He just thought Sylvia was like his plaything. He didn't give a shit. She was like a dog. A dog that he could kick whenever he wanted to because that's the kind of sick bastard he is. He would tell her really horrible things about herself. He would really try and tear away or chip away at her self-esteem. He didn't want her to feel good about herself. He wanted to make sure that she felt like shit all the time. And this control and this power also made its way into their sex life. I mean, surprise, surprise. Stephen didn't like normal, normal sex. Oh no. Oh no, it had to be violent, it had to be sadistic, it had to be domineering. He couldn't just have normal sex. And he would push Sylvia to her limits. He would do things that she wasn't comfortable with. Sylvia actually told one of her friends once that whilst they were having sex, Stephen actually put a pillow over her face and she couldn't breathe and she didn't like it and it made her feel really uncomfortable. Why, why, why would you want to smother someone you're having sex with? Like, And then eventually, Stephen started to become very interested in bondage. So he would start tying Sylvia up. He would start tying her hands together, her legs together. I read in one source that Sylvia actually admitted she didn't enjoy the sex that they would have. She didn't enjoy the bondage, but she did it because one, she loved Stephen, and two, she was afraid to say no. She was afraid to say that she didn't want to do that. So in the end, she would just back down and let him do whatever he wanted. Three months after the couple started their sexual relationship and started seeing each other, Sylvia actually found out she she was pregnant so she went to Stephen and she told Stephen she was pregnant and Stephen wasn't pleased Stephen was not pleased this was not in Stephen's plan Stephen didn't plan on being with Sylvia long term like I said she was just a plaything to him he was gonna have his fun with her and then he was gonna move on and go on and ruin someone else's life and then instead of you know trying to have a normal conversation with Sylvia sitting her down and saying maybe this isn't the best thing to do maybe we should look at alternative decisions Oh no, Stephen said to her, that ain't my baby. You've been sleeping with someone else, that ain't my baby. And obviously Sylvia was heartbroken by this. She was like, what do you mean? Like, you're the only person that I'm sleeping with. And he was like, no, it's not my baby. I think Sylvia had made the decision to keep the baby anyway. So the relationship was falling apart at this point because Stephen didn't want the baby and Sylvia knew that so she decided to move out of Stephen's flat move into one of her friend's flats and even though the relationship ended between Sylvia and Stephen she was still sleeping with him and you know what we can all put our hands up and say that because everyone's done it I've done it because you think that's going to make the person love you again or it's going to make them want to be with you again let me tell you it is not. So yeah, she was still sleeping with him. And on the 3rd of April 1998, Sylvia had just got her first paycheck from her job. She was so, so, so excited. So after she finished work and after she got her paycheck, she went to her friend's house. And I think she was drinking there for a little while. She was celebrating with her, with her friends. And then apparently her friend said that she left around at quarter past 11 that night. And from then on, Sylvia was never, ever seen again. So after a couple of days, Josie and Kathleen started to become concerned, obviously, because like I said, the girls were really, really close. They would speak near enough every day. They hadn't heard one word from Sylvia. So Josie asked Kathleen to ring Stephen and ask Stephen if he had seen or heard from Sylvia. So this is what Kathleen did. And when she rang Stephen, at first he didn't answer. But then I think the second or third time he answered and she asked him, have you seen my sister? Have you heard from her? And he said, no, I haven't seen her in like five days or something like that. Sorry, I can't help you. He did say like he'd help look for her and he'd help search for Sylvia and make sure that she was okay. But just to be sure, Josie and Kathleen actually went to Stephen's flat just to double check that Sylvia wasn't there. You know, he wasn't keeping her against her will. He wasn't doing something to her. And when they got there, the flat was empty. The only things they saw were a couple of um, backpacks up against the wall that looked like they had been filled with something. Stephen also had a loft. Um, it had like a little door kind of thing, you know, that you can push and go up in and there's a ladder. And Josie said that she looked up at the loft 
and Stephen saw her do this. And he got all flustered and he was like, okay, you need to leave now, you need to go, you need to go. So on the same day, on the 5th of April, after checking Stephen's flat, Josie and Kathleen reported Sylvia as missing. The truth is that Stephen did know where Sylvia was and he did know what had happened to her. And let me just tell you, the truth is fucking horrific. After Sylvia left her friend's house on the 3rd of April, at around quarter past 11 at night, she actually went to Stephen's house. When Sylvia got to Stephen's flat, there was two 12 year old teenagers there, a boy and a girl. The 12 year olds were drinking and they were getting high and they were in the front room and Sylvia turned up at the flat and Stephen took her into the bedroom and Stephen gave her some sleeping tablets. After he gave her the sleeping tablets, he suggested that he wanted to have sex and as usual, Sylvia just complied with what he wanted. He tied her up, he tied her up to the bed, he tied her hands together and he tied her feet together. Um, and then obviously she started to become drowsy because he's given her sleeping tablets. He then decided to put tape over her nose and over her mouth. Um, and then he also decided to inject Sylvia with insulin. Now, Sylvia, she wasn't diabetic. She didn't need insulin. And if you give insulin to someone that isn't diabetic, that doesn't need it, what it can do it is it can put them into a coma-like state. And like I said, he had tied her hands and her feet together. So what he'd done like before, he'd tied, um, I think it was like rope or something. He tied rope around her wrist. He then tied it around her neck and then he tied it around her other wrist. Feet were also tied together. Let's just go over what, what's happening here. First of all, he's tied her hands and feet together so she can't move. She's immobile. He's then blindfolded her, so he's taken his sight away from her. He's then put tape over her mouth and her nose, meaning that she can't fucking breathe. He's then injected her with insulin, what's going to put her into a coma-like state. So with all of those things combined, with restricting her breathing through putting the tape across her nose and her mouth, from the insulin, from the sleeping tablets, Sylvia succumbed to what he was doing to her and she she died she died from it because he's a sick twisted bastard after sylvia has died and she's laying on the bed lifeless still tied up stephen then proceeds to call the two 12 year olds like i mentioned that were still in the front room he he proceeded to call them into his bedroom and show them sylvia's body show them his work and he basically said well you're involved now because you've seen the body so him and the 14 year old boy actually moved Sylvia's body up to the loft. They carried her up to the loft and they wrapped her in a blanket and that's where they left her. And then they decided to go swimming because that is just fucking completely normal to take someone's life and then go for a swim. And then after the swim, they decided to come back to the flat and this is where I just, oh, this is what, this is what got me the most. After they returned to the flat from swimming, they brought Sylvia's body down from the loft and they brought her to the, the bathroom and they put her in the bathtub. And this is where Stephen dismembered her body with a hacksaw into seven parts. And you remember I said that Sylvia had got her first paycheck. I think it was around £25. I think that's how much she got. She had that money when she went to Stevens. Obviously, she had the money in her purse or her bag or whatever. He took that £25 from Sylvia's purse and he used that money to buy cleaning products and to buy bin bags and to buy all the stuff that he would need to clean his flat up so there wasn't a trace of evidence that Sylvia was ever there. Like, are you fucking joking me? You absolute disgusting pig. So after Stephen dismembered Sylvia's body in the bathtub, he then put her body parts in bin bags and then he put these bin bags into rucksacks. Do you remember that I said when Josie and Kathleen went round, they didn't see anything except from, um, except from rucksacks? Yeah, well, their baby sister was in those fucking rucksacks. Like, could you imagine? Could you imagine finding that out? Anyway, so he's got these rucksacks and he doesn't know what to do with them. So he then decides to contact a 20-year-old friend of his. 
by the name of Paul Rigby and he basically told Paul what he'd done. He told him that he'd killed Sylvia and he needed to get rid of the body and he needed Paul to help him. Instead of Paul calling the police and telling the police he was like, yeah, sure, no fucking problem. Paul turns up at Stephen's flat and they go on a hunt. They go to see where they can put Sylvia's remains. And this is when they stumble across a new set of houses being built. So Paul and Stephen, they see these new houses being built and they think, yeah, perfect, great. So they decide to bury Sylvia's body, body parts, remains under the floorboard of these new houses that were being built like I really just cannot I just cannot get my head around it Stephen's got rid of the body now and he, I, I genuinely think that he thought that he got away with it two weeks after Sylvia's disappearance the police actually come around his flat and took a formal statement and he told the police exactly what he told Josie and Kathleen that he hadn't seen Sylvia he didn't know where she was and that was it basically because the police couldn't find any evidence of Sylvia being there or any foul play or anything in the end they actually said to Kathleen and Josie you know she could have she could have run away like she could just not want to be found she's pregnant she might just she might have just run off somewhere she might just want to start a new life somewhere else but Josie and Kathleen both said no she wouldn't do that we know our sister we know that she wouldn't just up and leave so seven weeks go past and Sylvia still hasn't been found they still can't locate her and by this point it seems that Paul Rigby the person that had helped Stephen get rid of Sylvia's remains it seems like Paul couldn't come to terms or cope with what he had helped Stephen do on the 30th of May 1998 um, the police were called because Paul Rigby was in the middle of a park waving um, an air rifle around and I think just being really destructive and it said that he wanted to be arrested. His main goal for being in the park waving around the air rifle was so he could get arrested. So that's exactly what the police did. They arrested him and they brought him in for questioning and this is when Paul just broke down he just told them everything he just told them everything that Stephen had told them he told them where Sylvia's body was when they buried her what Stephen had told him had happened as in how he had killed Sylvia so after Paul's told them all of this the police obviously go to the house that he said that Sylvia was buried under or was buried in and it said that as soon as they opened the door they could just smell decomposition I've never smelt it, but I've heard that it is vile and it cannot be confused with anything else. So instantly they knew that Paul was telling the truth. And after searching for a while, they found Sylvia's body parts because, um, you know, she wasn't she wasn't home. He'd, he'd chopped her up like she was a fucking cow. Sylvia actually had to be identified by dental records. That was the only way that they could identify her and obviously in the end they did confirm that it was Sylvia's body. So after Paul's confession the police went and arrested Stephen and the two 12 year olds and at first bearing in mind this was the second time that they were taking a statement or interviewing Stephen and he was sticking to the same story. He hadn't seen Sylvia, he didn't know where she was, she wasn't there that night and then they interviewed him a third time and his story changed. He said, okay, yeah, she did come to my flat that night and she did die, but it wasn't me that killed her. It was a 12 year old boy. He had said that, yeah, he did let them come in and see Sylvia's body when he tied her up, but she had died because the 12 year old boy had started pulling on the rope around her neck and she suffocated and died. And he also said in this interview, the third interview that he had given Sylvia sleeping tablets and insulin and the police asked him why did you give her insulin she wasn't diabetic he said i just wanted to see her body's reaction right okay but stephen stephen was adamant he said it wasn't the insulin that killed her and i didn't kill her it was a 12 year old boy pulling on the rope around her neck he's the one that killed her so the police said okay that's the case if it was an accident why didn't you call the emergency services why didn't you call an ambulance straight away? And Stephen said because they were too scared and they were too much in shock. Now, not being funny, right? First of all, he's a part-time firefighter, okay? So I feel like firefighters, police officers, emergency services, 
they are trained to deal with situations that normal people like me and you would find shocking, that we would find really difficult to deal with. They are trained for that. They are also trained to give CPR and try to resuscitate people. So the police said that to him as well. They said, so why don't you try and resuscitate her? He didn't try to save her life at all. He didn't ring an ambulance at all. He just let her die on that bed. So they then interviewed Stephen um, a fourth time, I believe. And this is when he told the police about the dismemberment of the body. But once again, he didn't take any ownership of this. He said that it was a 12 year old boy's idea to dismember her in the bathtub. So after Stephen confessed about dismembering Sylvia's body in the bathtub, the police went back to his flat and they, I think they got some samples from the drain pipes and as you can imagine, there was so much blood in the, in the drain pipes and they obviously identified it as Sylvia's. Now they could place Sylvia in the flat and also where her body was dismembered. So they charged Stephen with first degree murder. And I read that Paul Rigby and the two 12 year old kids, the girl and the boy were charged with conspiracy to pervert justice by dismembering and concealing a body and destroying and concealing evidence surrounding the death of another individual. All three of them pleaded guilty. But do you think Stephen pleaded guilty? Oh no. Oh, no, he didn't. He pleaded not guilty because he said that it weren't his fault. He didn't kill her, which I think is a whole load of bullshit. And I also think they should have put a, a torture charge on there as well. I don't know if that even exists. Is there a charge like that? I don't even know, but I definitely think he should have had something like that because the way that this poor girl died and the way he treated her body after, just absolutely sickening. Stephen's trial was set for March 2000. And I'm sure, as you can imagine, after the jury listened to all of the evidence only after two hours of deliberating they found Stephen Scott guilty of first degree murder so he was given a life sentence and he was meant to serve the rest of this sentence or he was meant to spend the rest of his days in Magaberry prison but you know what the justice system is like it's fucked up do you think that he's still in prison no no of course he's not after 19 years of being in prison, Stephen Scott was released for good behaviour. So he's out and about, I think he's around 40 now, and I've read somewhere that he he regularly visits a KFC in Ireland. I don't know what town it is, but from the bottom of my heart, I truly hope that they spit and phlegm in his food. I truly, really, really do. The reason he was called a bulldog is because he was an animal. He's meant to be locked in a cage for the rest of his life. Absolutely disgusting man. I'm pretty sure you can tell that I've got no respect for this guy. Absolutely none. To take an innocent 17 year old teenager's life pregnant with his child and just discard her body like it was trash. Oh, makes me absolutely sick. I'm going to go now. I'll see you next week for another Tasty True Crime Tuesday. Bye, guys.